Let's find your way to your seats this morning. Go, go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. choose to say blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name good morning church good morning wow it's good to see you all here Happy 4th of July weekend. As we get ready to dedicate this time to the Lord, and you're all here for one reason, right? To glorify the Lord, to hear from God, to have the Holy Spirit move in your lives and your hearts right here, right now, in an ever-present, ever-living way that only God Almighty can do. Amen? Amen? All right, let's join me in our call to worship verses this morning, which would be Psalm 148, 7 through 13 says, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young maidens, uh, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Did that leave anybody off? Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and the heavens. Heavenly Father, we do pray, Lord, that today your majesty would be made more aware in each one of us this morning, Lord. That you would be exalted in our midst. That you would just revel that the the savory aroma of the praises of your people would just waft up to heaven to bring glory to you in our time together as a church to exalt you to praise you to give you thanks honor and glory in jesus name amen Amen. water you turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, into the darkness you shine. As we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Sing it out, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God 
God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Oh 
goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. next to you, tell them happy birthday, America.
this morning as we transition from our fellowshipping time to our, there we go. Ah, they turned the volume up. There we go. <laughs> All right, so just before we get to our message, uh, some of the um, announcements that we have this morning. Um, first, Terry just reminded me that every second Friday at 6.30, beginning this, uh, this Friday, this coming Friday, uh, their group worship, worship Through Music Ministry is held here at 6.30 every other, uh, every second Friday. Every second Friday. Did I say that right? All right. And also, obviously, I want to say happy 4th of July weekend to everyone. It's a great day to celebrate and give thanks to God for the founding of our great nation. And also, last week, as Christians, we, need to, we also ought to celebrate and give thanks to God that our Supreme Court ruled last week that they overturned Roe v. Wade, declaring that our U.S. Amen. Amen. Declaring that our U.S. Constitution does not guarantee the right to abortion. And as I was talking about this with uh, Jim and Jim, uh, Pastor Jim said, God's, sovereignty, God's sovereign decree for life is his alone. End of story. All right, so speaking of celebrating, also in the announcements, um, we praise God and have much to celebrate at our fourth annual church picnic. It's going to be Saturday, August 20th at Colt State Park from 10 a.m. until dusk. Come enjoy the fun and watch the sunset. This is a perfect event to bring family and friends. There is no cost. Just bring food for your family. This is a picnic-style event. Mark your calendar and come join us. There's also going to be no Sunday morning Revelation Bible study next week. We will resume that the following week on the 17th. And also tomorrow night, there will be no men's softball. Boo. <laughs> There's quite a bit that's going on here at Meeting House Bible Church. So for additional information, please look in our weekly newsletter. And if you don't yet receive that, and you would like to, please look in your contact connection card and write down your, connection, your contact information, pass it into one of our offering boxes, one in the front door, one on your way out on the side door, and we would be glad to add you to the list. There's, there's just a ton more that I didn't get a chance, or I'm not taking the chance to mention right now, but everything you need to know about what's going on in church is here. The team does a fantastic job with that. So that's for more information. And also this morning after the message, we will be taking, celebrating the Lord's table. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for a beautiful summer day. We thank you for everyone gathered here, for those who are able to watch online, Lord. We pray, Father, that during this message, Lord, that your spirit would have free reign in our hearts, Lord, that you would find and make good soil for these seeds to be planted to produce much, much fruit to your glory and to your honor. I mean, nothing that I say stick in anybody's mind, but only that which is of you, straight from your word, from the throne of God, into the hearts and minds of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue in our series in the book of Mark. We are in chapter 6, verses 45 through 56, the story of Jesus walking on the water. Now, this is a story that Anybody with any kind of a Christian background is aware of. This and the feeding of the 5,000. You learn it as a kid in Sunday school. You learn it at home. It's very, very common. We learn it. We, we just kind of know it, and we move on. Right? But there's also some um, very great spiritual lessons for us to learn in this story. They're precious, and we won't pass them by. There are things like we all have stormy seasons in life, even Jesus needed alone time in prayer with our Heavenly Father, and so much more so do we. Jesus has power over the storms of life, and so much more that we're going to find in this story of Jesus walking on the water. But over the last few weeks in study, immersed in our text, I noticed that interwoven in the story is a recurring question. A question no one in the story directly asks, a question that the text does not specifically ask, but it asks it repeatedly. It's so obvious it can be missed, like the nose on a face is so near that you miss it. 
The question is ultimately answered, and that question is the title of the message this morning. Who is this man? Who is this man? Our text today will answer the question in ways that may surprise you. So please stand, if you're able, to honor the public reading of the Holy Word of God as we read chapter 6, verses 45 through 56. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. But they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him, ran about the whole region, and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So this account that we read in Mark, there are parallel accounts to this in John and also Matthew, Matthew 14 and John 6. And in those accounts, there were a couple of differences, and, and um, one of them that you might recognize if you know these stories right off the bat is Matthew 14, when Peter got out of the boat. That's not in our story this morning, but it is relayed to us in Matthew 14. So why isn't that here would be the obvious question. Why isn't that here? Well, scholars attribute this to the eyewitness account recorded by Mark here that's most likely the reason why uh, Peter didn't want to draw any attention to himself. And that's why scholars think that it wasn't put in this, uh, in this uh, account here. And also in John 6, right after Jesus had fed the 5,000, Pastor Jim met, went over this la in last week's message. Um, uh, Jesus, in John 6, 15, it says, When Jesus perceived that they wanted to force him to be king. We have to remember, that's kind of a central thing that's going on in our text here, the, that, that huge multitude wanted to force Jesus to be king. And those are really the only differences in these, in these uh, parallel accounts. So for our message this morning, I have three points, kind of more of an outline, if you will. And they are, point one, Jesus dismisses everyone and prays alone. Point two, Jesus walks on water. Point three, Jesus' ministry simply continues. Now this story has multiple miracles in it, so right out of the miracles in it, so right out of the gate, the first thing I'd like to say is that this is a true story. Liberal or atheist scholars over time have done all they can to try to show why they think the miracles in the Bible are not miracles at all. They completely deny the miraculous. They say there were rational reasons as to how what seems to be miraculous is just pulling off trickery or that there's a natural cause and the disciples were just fooled. Just, I'll give you two examples. For example, uh, they will say that Jesus didn't actually walk on the water, but that he was on a sandbar only inches from the surface of the water, and it only looked like he was walking on the water. Isn't that nonsense? But that's out there. These kind, and there's a lot more like that. Or in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, previously, 15,000 actually, Jesus was actually in the mouth of a cave, and behind him he had a secret stash of fish and bread to make it appear that he supplied all that food from only two fish and five loaves. Can you imagine that? People, brothers and sisters, I, let me plead with your sense of reasoning. The Bible does not try to make an argument that there is a God. That there is a God. It presupposes it. It simply starts with the reality that God is, and everything logically flows from that. If you believe in the first words of the Bible, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's it. Case closed. 
Everything that is was created out of nothing by God, speaking it into being. Ex nihilo, you'll hear. That's a Latin word that theologians toss around. But it's true. God created everything. There was nothing, and he simply spoke it into being. God does miracles. God is in the miracle business. That's what he does. God is the only one throughout all eternity who can have a storefront window with a sign on it that says, miracles done here 24-7. And it would be true. That settles the issue of God doing miracles. God does miracles simple. Amen. So we can have confidence that this is a true story. Which leads us to point one. Jesus dismisses everyone and prays alone. Verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Immediately, you remember that's one of Mark's favorite words. He uses it 17 times in this gospel. Just remember, Jesus had just miraculously fed over 15,000 people. And now it seems he's breaking up the crowd as if to say, there's nothing to see here, move along, move along. In the parallel account in John 6, we see that the people that Jesus fed wanted to force him to be their earthly king. Right, at, right then and right there. They were convinced Jesus would be their new king who would conquer the Romans and feed them free filet of fish sandwiches for life. They wanted to make him king now. We can't really blame the disciples if they were falling into a trap, in this kind of trap as well. Um, this isn't in the Bible, but you can put yourself in their position, see what's going on. They may have been trapped with that too. Imagine if they, they had succeeded in making Jesus a king. He would need a cabinet. Who would his cabinet be but his 12 closest friends, his disciples? There's a real lure of pride that comes with the position of authority and of high-ranking public office. Perhaps, reading into the text purely in opinion, Jesus dismissed them first to keep from joining the crowd and making him king. Perhaps they didn't want to leave Jesus behind. I wouldn't want to leave Jesus behind. Maybe they remembered their last boat ride with Jesus, and even though he slept through the storm that almost killed them, at least he was with them. And now they want, he wants them to go alone. Whatever the reason, Jesus dismissed them first, and he needed to be forceful to convince them to do it. The text says he made them. That word made is a Greek word, anagadzo, and it doesn't mean a request or a pleading. It wasn't like Jesus was saying, hey guys, you know, I know we're having a lot of fun here. We're feeding all these people. This is awesome. I want you to go to the other side. Or, guys, please, I know. Just get in a boat and go to the other side, would you? This has nothing to do with that. This is force. This is compelled with authoritative command. Jesus had to force them to get into the boat. Remember, the disciples had already been up for over 24 hours at this point. And they were very weary after all that ministry and lack of sleep. And Jesus here makes or forces them to get into the boat. Sometimes we have to be made to do what the Lord wants us to, don't we? Forgive that person who has once again offended us. Forgive when what, when what has been done to us seems unforgivable. Forgive ourselves when we say we trust that God has forgiven us. Not to repay evil for evil, knowing vengeance is God's. Saying yes to the things of God and no to the lust of the flesh. That's the Christian life. That's the struggle. We don't want to obey God. We're compelled to obey God. When you read the Bible and you're convicted of sin, you have a choice. Continue in it, in disobedience, or obey in it. And watch the Lord bless but we're made to do that. The flesh wars against the spirit. So we're constantly being forced to do something. So here we find that these apostles, these uh, disciples are being forced to go across the boat, across the, the, the pond, the, le the lake, the sea. It's a sea, right? Sea of Galilee. So sometimes he tells us to do what he tells us to do doesn't make much sense to us either. But the disciples here... There seemed good reasons not to go. Why would we go across without Jesus? Why go across the lake, uh, the sea at such a late time of day? Why should we row a boat for miles across the sea? As tired as we are, that sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? 
Yo, Jesus, we, we're exhausted. We've been up for over 24 hours. We've been ministering all this time. We're exhausted. You want us to row across the sea? And the last time, again, the last time they were in a boat, they almost died and Jesus was with them. Nevertheless, they obeyed. Jesus sends his disciples on a mission. Go to the other side to Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is a town um, on the northeastern shore of Galilee, and it was home to Jesus' disciples, uh, Philip, Andrew, and Peter. I want to give us a picture. Many of you may know what the Sea of Galilee looks like if you've got Google, or if it, maybe some of you have ever been, or you've heard people that have been there. If you picture the Sea of Galilee is kind of kidney-shaped, but for illustration purposes, I want you to imagine it as just a, a circle like a, a watch face, not a digital watch, a regular analog watch. They're basically traveling from the 10 o'clock position to the 1 o'clock position on the Sea of Galilee. It's only a few miles. Oh, and just by way of reference, the Sea of Galilee is 67 square miles. How many of you have ever been to Lake Winnipesaukee? Lake Winnipesaukee is bigger, 71 square miles. So you can see all of Galilee from many, many, many different points. There's a, a famous tourist uh, spot, Eskol Overlook, that you can go up there and you can see everything, which helps explain why everybody could see where they were going. It wasn't nooks and crannies they could tuck and hide in. Everybody knew what everybody was, what everybody was doing on the sea. So anyway, so after Jesus dismisses his reluctant disciples, he then dismisses the crowd that wanted to force him to be king. What effort and time that must have taken. What did Jesus say to convince the crowd to leave? We're not told. At this point, the crowd must have been a bit confused. Why did Jesus send them away? They believe he will be Israel's king, and they wanted to make him king right now. Why didn't he want to be made their king? Surely, since he has such wisdom in teaching and can do miracles like this, he must be ready to be their king, and they're ready for him to be their king. What is going on here? Or maybe like John the Baptist, they ask this question, are you the one to come, or should we look for another? Is Jesus, what if Jesus isn't the next king? The question they were really asking, who is this man? Who is this man? So Jesus dismisses everyone. And as our text says, it says in verse 46, And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. This is what I would call kind of low-hanging fruit. This is, kind of, this is pretty evident that the example that Jesus is giving us here is that he took time alone to be with the Father in prayer. How much more do we, if Jesus needed to do that, how much more do we need to take time to be alone in prayer with our Heavenly Father. After days of ministry to thousands, Jesus takes time to regroup, spend alone time in prayer. He intentionally chose to get to a place of solitude to undistractedly focus on God in prayer. No music, no technology, just you and God. When dealing with the world and reality, take their daily toll. Our example here by Jesus is to spend alone time in prayer. Well, now on to the boat ride. The disciples had already had a long day, and even before they got sent down to the boat, they had fed the 15,000, and that, that event started, as the text says, that started late in the day. And in verse 47 of our text, it says, And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone, Jesus was alone on the land. Evening... We have to remember that the way that they would keep track of time, they didn't have watches or iPhones or anything back then. They, um, they used a Roman uh, uh, timekeeping method, which was watches of the night. At 6 p.m. began the first watch of the night. Each watch is divided into three-hour segments. So from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the first watch of the night. From 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. is the second watch of the night. From midnight to 3 a.m. is the third watch of the night, and then from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. is the fourth watch of the night. So when evening came, or evening came, this is 6 p.m. So the disciples are in their boat at about 6 p.m., the night of the feeding of the 5,000 or the, the 15,000. Jesus is no longer on the mountain. He is alone on the land. 
Jesus is perfectly at peace with himself because he knows the Father is always with him. And we can learn a lesson from this. There are some of us who don't like being alone. We get anxious. We must find something distracting to do. We need to do something rather than being alone with our thoughts. Jesus was just on the mountain praying with his Father. Now he's at peace, and yet no one else is around. One of the keys we find here is that fellowship with the Lord is a key to inner peace. And there's a ton of scriptures that, that come to bear on this. I want to share three of them with you. You know probably all of them. The first is Isaiah 26.3. It says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And Philippians 4, 6 through 8 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In verse 8 in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, this is kind of the key for unlocking that peace, is finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is true... Uh, whatever is uh, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And the think on these things really means to take an inventory. At that moment when you're stressful, you're anxious, and you pray with thanksgiving to God, and he's telling us right there, remember what I have done for you. Bring all these things. Take an inventory of what I have done for you. Read my word and find what I have done for my children over all these times. I am faithful. I can be trusted on. Yes, you'll go through hard times, but I am with you through those. So that's uh, another one of those keys to peace. And then most of us know uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when Jesus says, he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a peaceful, re reassuring uh, point for us. And Jesus is exercising these things. He went up on the mountain to pray. Now he's down on the shore all by himself at perfect peace. So our second point here is Jesus walks on the water. Jesus walks on the water. <clears throat> Through this part of our story, we will see, perhaps in a surprising way, how the answer to the question, who is this man, is dramatically demonstrated and declared. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. And he meant to pass them by. This is quite the storm. John's gospel account says that it was a huge storm. Literally, uh, the Greek is megas animus. It's a giant, giant storm. And they were heading east. The wind was against them, so they're basically encountering what we would call a nor'easter. And the nor'easter is a howling, dangerous winds, sometimes with hurricane force winds. That is not uncommon on the Sea of Galilee. And in the midst of this, in the middle of this, the text says, Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them. Wait a minute. It was night, so it was dark. It's about the fourth watch of the night, which means 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., the darkest part of the night. They're in a raging storm. Have you ever been in a storm that was clear, blue skies? So it's at night, the darkest part of the night. They're in a storm. It is pitch black out there. And according to the account in John, they're four miles out on the sea. It would be impossible for a mere man to see the disciples under those circumstances, let alone see that they were making headway painfully that word painfully is bazanizo, which means torturously. Put yourself in their shoes. You're rowing for nine hours? That's torturously. So Jesus demonstrates his divinity here by miraculously being able to see or be aware of what his disciples were going through. And not just the outward struggle that they were, uh, were having, which can be seen by the eye under different circumstances. But, this, but the descriptive word painfully or torturous means that Jesus knows their inner struggles. He knows their inner struggles, that which can only be known by the heart from four miles away on a black, stormy night, by the way, only by divinity. Now we see one of the strangest and unexpected events in the Bible. Jesus walks on the water. But hold on a minute. We have all heard this story a million times. 
we know it's Jesus and everything works out right, right? Let's forget that we know the ending. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes. And we'll get a better picture and a better appreciation of what's going on here. Matthew 6, I mean Mark 6, 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. At this point, no one knew it was Jesus. Think of that. No one knew it was Jesus. They didn't have the gospel of Mark to read. Nobody knew it was Jesus. All three accounts say that the disciples were afraid. They weren't afraid of Jesus. They knew Jesus. But right now, they see this figure walking to them. They think it's a ghost, and they're terrified. And even in Matthew 14, uh, uh, yeah, Matthew 14, in the account when Peter was walking on the water, what did he say? He said, if it be you. He didn't know that it was Jesus. If it be you. They thought that what they saw walking on the water was a ghost. It's actually a really bad translation of the, the Greek word here. The Greek word is phantasma, from which we get the word phantom. It's only used two times in the Bible, once here and one in one of the other parallel accounts to describe what they're seeing. And that means it has a very special, different, significant meaning than the, the usual word for ghost or spirit. That's the Greek word pneuma, which is air, rushing wind, or breath. And it ties into an old folklore that was common back in these days, an old folklore superstition that sailors at sea who were convinced they were about to meet a watery grave in a storm would see a phantasma, phantasma of someone who had died at sea, thus sealing their fate. No wonder they're so afraid. They see this image. Their superstitious minds are going to, oh, no, we're at sea. Remember, many of these guys were sailors. They were fishermen. So they knew this folklore. They see this image, and they're afraid that that is that, that, uh, that death uh, phantom. But before we get too hard on the disciples, let's remember that we know it's Jesus. They didn't. Let's remember their condition. They've been up almost two days now, <clears throat> so they were exhausted beyond anything we can imagine. A lack of sleep. Military trained people know this because you're trained to do that, and moms with newborns know this feeling. <laughs> There's no sleep. They have done nonstop ministry everywhere they went. They have done the physical task of passing out the food for over 15,000 people, and they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers from their fish fillet meal. <laughs> Jesus had to force them to get into the boat without him. They'd been rowing against the wind for, think of this, nine hours. Don't add anything else to the equation. Do you want to row against the wind for nine hours? That's a lot of struggle, and you're already exhausted. They were weary and exhausted beyond measure. Oh, and by the way, they found themselves in this predicament because they had obeyed Jesus. That often happens with us as Christians. We do what God wants us to do, and we find things turn out worse than we were hoping, right? Because the world hates us. Jesus says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. The more you live like Christ, the more the world is going to hate you. And the more you live like Christ, the more you're obeying him. And obedience often leads to tribulation. So these disciples were at their lowest, their weakest, most vulnerable, terrified, and hopeless in mind, body, and spirit. They truly did think that they were going to die. Oh, by the way, this is just a bonus. That's not really part of the message, but this is another uh, proof that God wrote the Bible. If the disciples were making this up, do you think they would write a story where they were chicken, terrified, afraid? Right? So... The point is the disciples are terrified. They'd, seen, they'd just seen the phantom of death for sailors. They're about to die. No wonder they're terrified. But do you remember the end of verse 48? It said, walking on the sea, he meant to pass by them. It's a very odd statement, pass by them. Jesus demonstrates he's God first by miraculously walking on the water, water he created that obeys him, just as do the laws of nature, which he also created and sustains. That's a miracle. And here it says he would have passed them by. It's not as though he was actually going to pretend to keep going, testing them to see if they would cry out to him for help. This is a very special and intentional use of the phrase here by the scripture's author, the Holy Spirit. Pass them by 
is the exact same expression God used in Exodus when Moses asked to see his glory. In Exodus 33, 22, Moses had asked to see the glory of God, and no one can see the full glory of God and live, no human. So what he says, he says, he says, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. In the Jewish mind, the, the phrase passed by as relates to God was what's called a theophany. It is an actual appearance of God in the Old Testament. And it demonstrates here when Jesus uses this phrase, when the Holy Spirit inspires this phrase, he meant to pass them by. He wasn't doing so reluctantly. He's about to show the glory of God. So there are also several other occurrences in the Old Testament of this pass by, and they all deal with uh, the presence of God. I'm not going to quote them all, but I'll just tell you what they are. 1 Kings 19.11, Amos 7.8, Amos 8.2, and Job 9.11, just for starters. So Jesus' intent here was, again, not to casually pass them by as if indifferent to their needs, waiting to see if they were smart enough or desperate enough to ask him to join them. Jesus' intent was to make his glory known to them. Jesus is answering the underlying, unasked question, who is this man? The disciples knew somebody was there, but they did not know who it was. Jesus is declaring that he is God clearly understood by the Jews as an earthly appearance of God, that passing by. And he's not done yet, as we're about to see. In verse 50, second part of verse 50, it says, But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, but they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Take heart? Be not afraid? Take courage? Why should I take courage? Right now I have no courage. Can't you see? I'm about to die out here in the sea. Why on earth should I now take courage? Just because some apparition, a phantom of the Dead Sea says so. Well, here's why. Jesus follows the take heart statement with the only words that could possibly help. Our text says, it is I. In the Greek, it's ego am I. I don't know why on earth they ever translated ego am I. I mean, uh, it is I. It is I am. It is always I am. And many of you are shaking your heads because you recognize what that is. Jesus is speaking the same phrase that Moses heard at the burning bush when he asked God, who should I say sends me? In Exodus 3, 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, you shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. This is the great I am statement. The eternally self-existent one, God. This cannot be overemphasized. To the disciples, it cannot be misunderstood. Clearly, like a, like a lightning bolt across their heart and their mind. This is a, a shock to them right now. It could not be misunderstood. It was clear as a bell. Jesus says the ego am I statement in parallel accounts in <clears throat> Matthew and John. And also in John, when he's about to be arrested several times, he says, I am, or it is I. And uh, in John 18, he says, uh, it is, they're looking for Jesus, and they say, we're looking for Jesus. He says, it is I, and they fell back as dead men. Why? He just said, it's I. That is the statement, I am God. Unmistakable, clear as a bell, I am God. Jesus says this numerous times, and each time he's saying, I'm God. By the way, this is the only reason that the Pharisees had put Jesus to death. He claimed to be God. That's in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 10, 33 says, speaking, the Pharisees said, the Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you for blasphemy, but you being a man, make yourself equal with God. This is how the disciples could take heart. Who is this man? God. God is here with you. The disciples are seeing a man's shape, but they don't know who is this man. Jesus answers the question by flat out declaring he is God. A paraphrase of what Jesus is saying would be, be brave, it's Jesus here, I'm God, I'm here with you so you don't have to be afraid. Mic drop right there, right? Should they say, done? He says, don't be afraid. 
Jesus brings comfort to them in the midst of the chaos and confusion. By the way, don't be afraid. Happens to be the same expression in Exodus when the Israelites were at the water's edge of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's chariots were bearing down on them to kill them. Moses lifted up his staff and said, Exodus 14, 13, Moses said to the people, Fear not, don't be afraid. Stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Jesus is declaring, I am God. I am going to bring deliverance to you today. The disciples understood clearly and were, the text says, utterly astounded as Jesus got into the boat and the wind ceased. Within moments, the exhausted and terrified disciples had just witnessed three miracles. Jesus walking on the water. Jesus declared he is God. Jesus calmed the storm. No wonder the text says the disciples were utterly astounded or amazed. This is not just an extra surprise. The word here is extimai, extimai. And it, it, is not, uh, it, it is not your average surprise. It means almost to be insane, become astounded, insane, to be beside yourself, almost uncontainable. This is not just surprising. There is much more. And I want to illustrate this uh, with this example I heard in, in my studies. It's kind of like a basketball coach who was blindfolded at midcourt with the possibility of $10,000 if he makes a half-court basket blindfolded. The audience had already uh, secretly agreed to cheer wildly when he shoots, even though no one thought he would make it, just to trick him into thinking he did. And apparently the coach did make the shot. The crowd went wild and shouted like crazy and were amazed. That's one kind of amazement, but not this kind of amazement. Now, pretend, pretend that after the coach made the shot, the crowd started running down from the bleachers, gathered around to congratulate him, and as they got closer to him, he takes off his blindfold, he crosses his arms, and he begins to gently levitate off the ground and fly across the gym. <laughs> that is a different kind of amazement. And that's the kind of amazement we're talking about here with the disciples. Jesus was a flesh and blood man who had done many miracles in their midst, two and four others. He just walked on the water. The same man Jesus said, relax, fellas, I'm God. There's nothing to be afraid of. And for good measure, he makes the wind and the storm cease as he gets into the boat. The disciples had come to know that their friend, this man Jesus, could do the miraculous. It's constantly amazing. They even believed that this man Jesus was sent from God. But to grasp that God himself is physically with you, that you can look into his eyes, you can touch him, hug him, that God in the flesh was with them, Jesus Christ. We too ought to have a high degree of amazement that God himself revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And that God in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, dwells in every born-again believer. You don't have to make a long-distance call when you want to talk to God. He's right here. He's always watching, always listening. No matter how much of the day we've ignored him, maybe walked away from him, he's there every microsecond of the day. Almighty God dwelling in us. So this evidence is amazing. The disciples asked the question, who is this man? And they could barely get their minds around it, despite all of the evidence. But amazement and faith are not the same. Amazement and faith are not the same. And that is why the next verse says, in 52, they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. This is not the same kind of hardened that we see in Exodus, when Pharaoh repeatedly hardened his heart against God and Israel. This is more... Uh, that the disciples were dull of heart, resistant to make the connection between the evidence, the miracles, that they had seen the man Jesus do, and the point of the miracles which he did was to convince them that he is God. Do you remember the dialogue um, between Peter, uh, Philip and Jesus? Philip wants to know, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus is almost indignant. He says, have I been with you for so long, and you don't know me, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Then he finishes, this is uh, John 14, 8 through 11. In verse 11, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. 
or else believe on account of the works themselves. Miracles in the Bible demonstrate that God is at work, that he is the cause of the miracles, and they glorify God. They don't cause people to get saved. That is another miracle, the miracle of regeneration by the Holy Spirit through the gift of faith from God. We would hope, think, that someone who has experienced a miracle would naturally come to saving faith. And that's why, well, we all do it, right? We pray for our unsaved loved ones and ask the Lord to do a miracle so amazing in their lives that they can't deny that it's God. And because of that, that they get saved. Being amazed at miracles doesn't save people. Faith saves. So back to our hardened, stiff, or dull-hearted disciples. Again, put yourself in their position. They're physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually exhausted, worn out, weary. Have you ever been there? Fighting with the sea for their very lives, becoming more and more hopeless with each passing moment. They see what in their superstitious mind is a phantom of the death, and they are terrified that they're at last about to die. When the phantom speaks and says, paraphrase, chill guys, it's me, Jesus, I'm God, everything's going to be okay. This is Jesus. They just had fish fillet sandwiches with him yesterday on the shore with 15,000 people. This, as the people in Jesus' own town said, is the carpenter's son who has brothers and sisters. This is a man who cried when Lazarus died and wept over Jerusalem. This is a man who made a whip of cords and drove out the money changers at the temple, saying, my father's house shall be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. This is a real flesh and blood person. But who is this man? This man Jesus demonstrated and declared he is God in human flesh, dramatically demonstrated and declared his divinity. That is who this man is. And it is in keeping with the opening statement of the Gospel of Mark. One, and chapter 1, verse 1 says, The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Who is this man? Jesus Christ, Son of God. Jesus Christ is God, fully man, fully God, God incarnate, almighty God in human flesh. No wonder even the wind and the waves in awe and obedience settle before the Almighty as Jesus gets into the boat. In the parallel account in John we find out that they were immediately at the shore. That's another miracle. If Jesus gets into the boat, the wind stops, and boom, they're at the shore. No more struggling. Jesus takes care of their toil and their struggling. In verse 53, it says, When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. They resisted, and Jesus forced them to go. Ultimately, Jesus made sure that they got where they were going, experienced the kind of tribulation that they needed to endure to, in order for them to learn what they could learn in no other way. And what did they need to learn? Who is this man? God in the flesh. So after such a torturous ordeal, after being so exhausted, after experiencing miracle after miracle with Jesus, you'd think that they would take some time off to contemplate what just happened, maybe to celebrate their safe arrival, celebrate their deeper faith knowledge that Jesus Christ is not only a miracle-working Son of God, but he is actually God in person. But what happens next? Point three, Jesus' ministry simply continues. Verses 45 uh, 54, sorry, through 56. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized them and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to, whoever, to wherever they heard that he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. As many as touched him were made well. That's an interesting part that was added there, as many as has touched his garment. Could it be that the woman who had the issue of blood, who touched his garment, maybe that news spread like wildfire, and they're like, hey, all you got to do is touch his garment. We're not told that, but isn't it interesting that, that the same thing has happened? People would just want, they'd lay on the ground, they just want to touch his garment as he went by. And just as Jesus said to the woman with the issue of blood, your faith has made you whole. So our first uh, verses, uh, verses 45 through 54 take place in less than a day. These last three verses take place over an extended period of time. You notice he goes from town to town, to village to village, cities to cities, marketplace to marketplace. The idea is 
just another day, another day of ministry. The ministry of God and Christ on earth through his people is just like that. It goes on and on and on, the normal daily routines of life, sometimes punctuated with mountaintop experiences with God and sometimes in valleys so low, we don't think that he's with us. He is God, he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. So in conclusion, it's one thing to believe that Jesus was a unique, special man sent by God, a man who God performed miracles through and who spoke the things of God. God did that through the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. Many other religions and cults say Jesus was from God and he was a great moral teacher and even that he was a prophet of God. So the ultimate question, and I pose it to all who are listening, who is this man? To quote C.S. Lewis, Lewis in Mere Christianity, warning about this error, he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying that the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that choice open to us. He did not intend to. End quote. Who is this man? We only have three choices. He's a liar, a lunatic, or he's a lord. He's a liar because he claimed to be God. If he's not God, he's a liar. He's a lunatic because he received worship and only God is worthy of worship. Or he really is Lord choice between you and God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our time together in your word, and I pray once again, Lord, that there's been much seed cast out into much fertile soil, Lord. Pray, Father, that the point of this whole message, Lord, that you've been burning on me for our, my study time is that you're not just a man you're not just a man who God did miracles through. You are God in the flesh. And the unimaginable reality that had to strike into the hearts of the disciples as the person they could hug, they could talk with, they could walk with, they could touch and fellowship with is you, God Almighty, in flesh. May we have an ever-increasing sense of awe and wonder of the miracle of regeneration that you personally indwell us because of what Christ did on a cross for us, Lord. We thank you so much for our time in your word, Lord, and I want to reach out to anybody right now, Lord, who doesn't truly know you, maybe pretenders, maybe people who profess to be Christians but don't possess the Holy Spirit, those who may be against you right now as, as atheists or those who hate you and claim to be atheists. There is a choice. Who is this man? I pray, Father, right now, Today is the day of salvation, that today, right now, as you're tugging on the hearts of your people, Lord, this is between you and them, that they would bow the knee before Almighty God, confessing and repenting that they indeed are sinners in need of judgment, facing certain judgment when they face you at the end of this life, and that you, Lord Jesus Christ, paid for that sin. It's the only payment possible is life. The wages of sin is death. Jesus, who was sinless, paid that death for us so that we might have life by faith. So we thank you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, now it's time for us to prepare for the Lord's table. Communion, if the ushers would come forward and begin passing out the elements. Let us do so with a renewed sense of awe and gratitude, realizing that Jesus Christ's substitutionary death on the cross for our sins was accomplished not merely by a prophet of God, not a great moral teacher, nor merely a man through whom God did astounding miracles. Our substitution is God himself in Christ. Jesus actually said in John 10, 18, he says, no one takes my life, I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Our communion here is an open communion 
All you need to be is a born-again Christian. And between you and God, you need to know that you need to make sure that you are right with God, that you are not taking the elements unworthily. So as we wait, take a moment of silence to pray. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, we have our, the text that deals with our communion. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. You may partake. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do, as often as you do, drink it. Do it in remembrance of me. You may partake. Heavenly Father, we do once again... As we partake in this ceremony, Lord, I pray that it is, has been a solif- uh, solemn and purifying time, Lord. Not just another event to do, Lord, but something in which we can truly appreciate in a new and deeper way and offer such inexpressible gratitude to you for taking the punishment for our sins. Words cannot express thanks enough, Lord. The greatest gift that we have to give back to you, which is not even enough, is ourselves. I pray, Father, that we would, in a, in a renewed way, offer ourselves to you, as Romans 12 says, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. We give you praise and glory and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand in worship. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God. Fill my life again I give my 
my life to follow everything I believe in. And now I surrender. Yes, I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is my. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, and Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to mighty to save forever, author of salvation, the heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. I bet you didn't have to ask the disciples if he was mighty to save, amen? Amen. <laughs> Our benediction verse today, this morning, a blessing and encouragement, I hope, to all of us, very common, uh, well-known verses in Romans, chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. Now, if you're in the boat with the disciples before Jesus shows up, you're kind of thinking Jesus left you, he doesn't care about you, but listen to this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sakes we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, again, oh Lord, you're awesome. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. I pray that we would go out from these doors changed, every single one of us here in church, those watching, with a renewed sense of awe of who you are and how much you love us, how you take such great care of us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if y'all would stay for just a second.